Hello again, my little conscripts, and welcome to another Warhammer 40k Mordian Glory video. Today's episode is going to be another Tale of a Tournament Gamer, the series where I talk about all of the crazy things and people that I've encountered during my tabletop career. Now, so far in this series, I have been detailing the negative encounters I've had, the bad people I have met. For example, in our last episode, I told you the story of Dave, the worst Games Workshop manager I have ever encountered. And don't worry, I'll make sure there's a link to that episode at the end of this one. But now it's time to turn the tables. Now it's time to shine the spotlight on myself. For he who stares in the abyss must be prepared for the abyss to stare back into him. And I'm going to tell you the story of my greatest shame. I'm not going to lie to you guys. This is a bad one. I fully expect to get a lot of flack for this story. In fact, in my local gaming group, this is something that my friends still tease me about to this day, despite the fact it took place almost a decade ago. So grab your popcorn, get your pitchforks ready, and be prepared to lambast me down in the comment section, because this is the tale of the time that I made a girl cry at a Warhammer 40k tournament. As is tradition, I want to set the scene for you guys. This whole incident took place in 7th, in the middle of that edition, right at the peak. At this point, 40k was ridiculously competitive. It was utterly cutthroat. We were at that precipice between where the game is popular and it's drawing lots of people back in because it's a newer edition and the point where people start getting burned out because everything is just so overpowered and overtuned and kind of broken. And most people going to these events were very experienced. Either they've been playing 40k for a long time and they've just been going and going and going and now they were playing 7th edition or they had joined with 7th but they had stuck with it despite the fact that this thing was pretty janky. If you never played 7th edition, it's hard to understand just how bonkers 40k play was at this time. You had entire armies that physically just couldn't be hit because of a spell called invisibility. You had Death Stars, which involved your entire army being in a single unit and that unit being literally unkillable. You had 2 plus re-rollable invulnerable saves and you had things like Farsight Bomb, which was a Tau tactic that could drop in and this only cost about a thousand points to do it, but it could delete about 1500 points out of the enemy list in one shooting phase. If you thought 9th edition was somewhat unbalanced, let me assure you it doesn't even come close. It's not on the same planet as where 7th edition was at this point. And despite how gnarly the game was, your boy MG here was still playing it very regularly. Even though Imperial Guard were definitely, I'm not even going to say probably, I'm going to say definitely the worst faction by a country mile. And when I say Guard were bad, I mean they were almost unusably bad. I would go to events and be the only person there running guard. And I'm not talking about local RTTs where there might be a dozen or two dozen people. I'm talking events with 50 to 100 players and I'm winning best in faction by default. However, despite the consensus by the wider community that the Ashram Tower was basically a dead faction, I had achieved a moderate amount of success with them. Through sheer stubbornness and blooded mindedness, I had essentially spent the last 12 months bashing my head against a brick wall, going to event after event, getting my ass handed to me, but every single time learning some new tactics and developing my competitive list. In fact, I had managed to claw myself up to an average win rate of about 50%. Sometimes I did a bit worse if it was a real shark tank, sometimes I do a bit better, 
But I was confident that every time I went to a tournament, I was at least going to get one win under my belt and maybe a draw or two as well. This success was in large part due to the fact that I was running pure infantry guard. You see, I'd worked out early on in 7th edition that toughness and armor saves weren't really going to mean anything. And turning up with a bunch of Lehman Russes and Chimeras was just a quick way to get tabled. Rather, it was all about how many wounds I could spam onto the table for the cheapest possible price point. To me, it didn't make sense to spend 150 points on a main battle tank, which at best would have the equivalent of three wounds. They were known as hull points back in the day, and at worst could get blown off the table by a single high-powered anti-tank shot because you had things like the vehicle damage chart, and you also had destroyer weapons, which literally destroyed any model in the game that they touched, regardless of their toughness or wounds. Rather, I would spend these same points on a maxed out squad of conscripts and get 50 wounds onto the table. And it was this simple yet brutal equation which allowed me to catch a number of players off guard and get a few surprise wins. I mean, to them, losing 100 infantry in a turn would be a crippling blow, something they could not recover from. And for them, killing 100 of my infantry surely meant that the game was already in the bag. But to me, that's just called turn one. Those were acceptable casualties and ones that I'd already taken into account and put into my calculation. To give you an idea of my mindset at this time, my go-to opening turn one tactic was to take a full strength platoon and march them out into the open. This meant that my opponent would inevitably take the bait and shoot that platoon. And that was fine because that squad's one job was to count how many guns the enemy had to let me measure their firepower. You see, if I'm running a 300 plus man army and my opponent can't wipe out a 40 man squad in one turn, what that means is I have physically more bodies than he has bullets and I can absorb that many casualties turn in, turn out and still get to the end of the game without being tabled. And conversely, if the opponent was able to nearest damn it or completely destroy that blob, it meant that I had to play a bit more carefully, stick to cover and try and husband the resources that I have. Essentially, I was sacrificing the lives of my men to gather intelligence on my opponent's capabilities. Tiny quick little tangent, but it was these tactics and this success I'd been able to have with the guard that motivated me to create the Mordian Glory channel in the first place. If you go back and watch some of my earliest videos, they're all talking about how you can actually win games in 7th edition with guard if you try out these pure infantry tactics. Because I used to go on a lot of forums like Daka Daka and one of the most common posts you'd see there every week would be, I can't win with guard, what am I doing wrong? And the most common reply to those kind of threads would be, well, guard are terrible, you can't win with them. And I didn't like that. I didn't agree with that. And I wanted to show people that you could win with the Imperial Guard, that they weren't a totally dead faction. But going back to the main story, the reason I'm telling you all of this is now you have an idea for what peak 7th edition looked like and what kind of tactics I was being forced to develop and use just to have a dog's chance in hell of winning a single game. And now let's move on to the tournament where this fateful incident took place, where I heaped upon myself much shame and infamy. It was at one of the old Caledonian Uprising events at Element Games. Now, for those of you that don't know, Caledonian Uprising, or Cali for short, were some of the first really big 40k events. At the time, getting 30 to 40 people to show up to a tournament was a pretty big deal, and most RTTs would be lucky to have a dozen people attend. Cali would pull in 100, if not 200 people pretty consistently and they were essentially the first super majors before the term super major even really existed in competitive 40k and like with big tournaments nowadays because of its size and scope cali had a certain amount of pedigree and prestige 
This meant it attracts some of the best players. And we're not just talking in the UK, we're talking in the world. People from all over Europe would travel to the UK just to play at Caledonian Uprising. And it was not uncommon to have a delegation from the United States also turn up. I think you guys get the idea. The point is that it was a pretty big deal. Now, what's interesting and a little known fact about Element Games is they used to actually have two halls for people to play in at their venue. They had the main hall, which was upstairs, and that was where all of the lovely tables and terrain was. That's where the fully stocked bar is, all the things that we know and love about that venue. And then they had the overflow area. Now, I don't think they use it anymore, but this was basically the basement. And I'm not gonna lie, it was a little bit grim. There's a reason they stopped using it. Bare concrete floors, windows with holes in them or that are permanently jammed open with rust, and no central heating makes for a pretty bleak gaming environment. And what's kind of funny is, depending on how well you were doing at the tournament, that would determine which one of these halls you would get to play in. If you're doing well and you're winning your games, well, come on up to the main gaming hall with all the heating and the lovely terrain and the fully stocked bar, all the drinks and comforts you could possibly want. But if you're doing badly, you get relegated downstairs. You get sent to the basement and it's no wonder that this place was affectionately known as the Bitch Zone. Now, me running guard, and this being 7th edition, me and the Bitch Zone were very well acquainted with each other. We were firm friends. I was used to the environment that I was playing in. And so I knew that when I was going to an Element Games tournament, I was going to need to bring some thick socks and a nice warm jumper. But those people who had not been to Element Games before, especially those who were traveling from abroad, perhaps from a slightly warmer climate, or people who had just not had the opportunity to experience the delights of the bit zone before, would often be completely blindsided by how cold it was down there. It was not an uncommon thing to see people stamping their feet and blowing onto their hands to try and keep them warm. And it was in this charming biome where it all happened. It was round three, an old Caledonian uprising. The first two rounds had gone about as well as could be expected. I think the first game I faced off against 11 Tau Riptides, all which could fire four times each a turn. <sighs> the beauty of the old formation system, guys. I don't miss it. Against that kind of firepower, even my endless waves of infantry couldn't last long and, well, the game had been over pretty quickly. And round two, if I remember correctly, I had the misfortune of encountering an invisible wolf star, which had gone through me like a dog eating a bag of hot chips. But I wasn't phased. At the end of the day, this was a pretty standard opening tournament experience for me. I always lost the first few games, but managed to claw it back once I descended into the murky depths of the bottom tables. But for most people, even more so those ones that weren't absolute tournament fiends, getting utterly destroyed in the first two games could be quite a sobering experience and a bit of a shock to the system. Enter left of stage, my unfortunate victim and my round three opponent, who for the purposes of this video, we're gonna call Cat. Now, Kat was a lovely person who had traveled to the tournament with her boyfriend and they'd actually flown over from Germany. And what's crazy is they'd caught their flight that very morning. They got a really early one, come to the UK, dumped their stuff in the hotel that was just around the corner and then gone straight into the event. Naturally, that's gonna make anyone feel pretty tired. And I get the impression that maybe Kat's boyfriend was the one that was more into the competitive 40k, but she'd wanted to come with him for the weekend and she knew how to play the game, so why not join in so they could spend some time together at the event? But don't get the wrong impression, dear viewer. Kat was no fluffy bunny player. She still knew what she was doing and she had a pretty good list to boot as well. 
She was running a combined Elder and Dark Elder skimmer spam list. This meant that she had loads of Wave Serpents and Raiders and Venoms filled to the gills with loads of hard-hitting combat infantry. This style of army was actually pretty common at the time because it abused the Jink rule. How this worked was if one of your skimmers or flyers was targeted by an enemy unit before they rolled their shots, you could declare that your vehicle was going to Jink. And Jink gave you a four plus cover save. Now cover worked very differently back in the day. It wasn't just extra bonuses to your armor save, it essentially gave you a pseudo invulnerable save. The downside of jinking though, is your unit would then only hit on sixes. You're pulling some pretty serious evasive maneuvers. It's kind of hard for your guys to stay on target. But Eldar had battle focus, which meant that even if they jinked, they could still hit at their normal ballistic skill. It's not hard to see therefore why this list was popular. You could take all of your, what were normally fragile Eldar vehicles and make them pretty tough. At the same time, you didn't have to sacrifice any firepower and you were pretty fast. So you could get into the fight quickly and start delivering combat into the heart of the enemy. But as good as this all was, it wasn't invincible. And Kat had unfortunately drawn a couple of bad matchups in her round one and two. And this had caused her to lose her first two games quite heavily. But hey, from her perspective, things were about to start looking up. She was going to turn this franchise around because her game three was going to be against me and my guard. And we all know how terrible Imperial Guard are. All those Lehman Russes and tanks and other vehicles are going to be useless against the Eldar Skimmers and their invulnerable saves. This should be a nice, easy win to end the first day on a high note. Sadly, it didn't take long for this safety blanket of false hope to be violently ripped away from her. Because as we both get to the gaming table and we start chatting and introducing ourselves and talking about the games that we've played so far and the armies that we're using, Kat inevitably asks me, okay, so what have you got in your army list? And I hand her a paper copy of my list. That's how things were done back in the day before we had BCP. Because as she's going through the list line by line, it becomes clear there are no tanks in my list. And instead, it's just platoon after platoon of guard infantry. Not only that, but all of these platoons are equipped with auto cannons and grenade launchers and lance cannons, which are the quintessential anti Eldar skimmer weapons. But to her credit, Kat rallied pretty quickly. After the initial shock of seeing the list and me pull out an army tray with 300 guardsmen stacked on it, she was pretty cheerful. And no matter how you slice this cake, this was still the undisputed bottom faction going up against one which was considered in the top three. Sure, I got a bunch of guns that on paper at least kind of counter her core units, but this is guardsmen shooting. I only hit on fours, I don't have any way of getting better than hitting on fours, so half of the mud that I throw at the wall ain't gonna stick, and half of the stuff that does is gonna be blocked by her cover save. But once all the pre-game preamble had been resolved, the preamble, if you will, both players had swapped their lists, we'd worked out deployment zones, who was getting which side, it was time to start setting up models on the board. Although this is a tournament, I like to have a bit of fun with it, and I am an infantry commander at heart, so I've got to deploy my guys in a narrative cinematic way. So I've got all of my blocks of infantry formed up in beautiful ranks and making sure they're all shoulder to shoulder, presenting a hedge of bayonets. Bear in mind, this is an addition where we had like blast templates. So deploying in blocks of infantry was pretty suicidal, but I like doing it. Hey, I'm running guard at the end of the day. Let's just roll with it, right? And I have all of my heavy weapon teams like dug into ruins and I've got my commanders leading from the front, all of that good stuff. Seeing my rather splendid, if not totally uncompetitive setup, Kat decides to go for an aggressive deployment of her own. I've got a lot of stuff on the front line and that makes quite a tempting target for some early game charges. So she ends up deploying a lot of her units on the line as well. 
this wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Remember, she thinks she's got this 4 plus cover save in the back of her mind. That's going to be saving a lot of damage. Even if she goes second, she should be able to weather the storm. And because of the way both sides have deployed, she'll be able to zoom forward and might even get some early game turn one charges. And that's what she wants to do because she is an aggressive combat force. As it turns out, I go first. His Imperial Guard steals the initiative. And I begin marching my men forward with bugles and trumpets blaring. This isn't a total meme maneuver. I'm running an infantry force. It's pretty slow. I only go about six inches a turn. If I don't get a wiggle on, I'm going to miss out on objectives. I'm not going to be able to take some vital ground. It also allows me to start crossing no man's land and getting more of my special weapons like grenade launchers and plasmas into range. And I brought a hell of a lot of both of those guns. And it's quite an impressive and stirring sight, if I may say so myself. I mean, just imagine this. Picture it in your mind's eye, boys. You've got over 300 guardsmen, all fully painted, all in beautiful Mordian Iron Guard colours, marching forward in unbroken ranks. And because I've got the first turn, I've not taken any casualties yet, so it looks really cool. But I'll stop wanking myself off now. I'll save that for the early fans. Once I'd finished my movement phase, it was time to get into shooting. And this being a guard shooting phase, naturally the first thing we needed to do was issue our orders. If you're not familiar with the Imperial Guard and how they work in 40K, one of their unique mechanics is orders. Basically, it's your officer's ability to hand out small buffs to the infantry around them. For example, you've got one called Move, 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 which lets your guys move a bit quicker across the board, but they can't shoot instead. And in 7th edition, the go-to orders for the guard that most people used as their bread and butter was Bring It Down and First Rank Fire. Bring It Down gave you the ability to re-roll to wound against enemy vehicles, and First Rank Fire, Second Rank Fire gave you extra shots from your LAS rifles. Now... In this scenario, neither one of those orders were that helpful. I don't need the extra rifle shots. In 7th edition, small arms like LAS rifles couldn't physically hurt enemy vehicles. So there's no point in getting more shots that literally aren't going to do anything. Bring it down is a bit more useful, but the problem is that I don't have an issue with hurting the enemy. I've got lots of heavy weapons. I have a problem with hitting them. So even if I do manage to hit them, getting those reroll to wounds is nice. But don't forget that my opponent has a 4 plus cover save. She can just jink. So even if I do get the wound through, she's just going to block it with that. But hey, it's better than nothing. And I'd rather have an anti-vehicle buff than not have one, right? And just as I'm about to issue, bring it down to all of my units, I stop. And it's like I get hit by a lightning bolt of inspiration. It's like the Emperor himself whispers seductively in my ear. Because there is another order. One which is not used very often. One which is particularly situational. But one which in this case is absolute kryptonite for my opponent. The order in question is fire on my target. And this does one simple, beautiful thing. It allows my units to ignore cover. Normally, this order isn't all that great. With Marines running around in power armor and how armor penetration worked back then, you didn't really often need to ignore cover. But in this situation, it's utterly devastating it completely counters my opponent's entire game plan the whole thing that she's built her army around and what's worse is this is an order you can only issue to infantry if i was running a mixed guard list or a typical tank heavy guard list like a lot of people did in seventh then this order wouldn't be a big deal. Maybe a couple of squads would benefit from it. But because I'm running pure infantry, every single one of those 300 infantry models in my army can now benefit 
from Egnor's cover. Without hesitation, I gleefully declare that I'm going to be issuing fire on my target to as many of my units as possible. Kat's a little confused and she says, oh, what does that order do? I've never heard of that one before. I assumed you were just going to do bring it down. That's the one that most people use. And I say, well, I was thinking about doing that, but then I realized that fire on my target allows me to ignore your cover. And I've got enough heavy weapons where I'm not too worried about having to reroll wounds. Really, just being able to get rid of that cover save is a massive bonus for me. And this look of panic just enters her eyes. And she's like, wait, 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 you need to show me that rule in the codex. That's massive. That's going to completely change the game. And I get my codex out and I show it to her. And she just looks heartbroken, boys. Because she knows, as well as I do, this is going to have a big impact on the game. And she gets a bit upset. She sits down in a chair, folds her arms, grumbles a little bit. And it's like, well, I wouldn't have deployed my army in this way. I would have known you could have done this. But there's not much she can do about it. I can see she's quite upset about this. And I try and console her. And I'm like, hey, look, it's just guard shooting at the end of the day. I still got to hit you on a four up. That's very swingy. It could go either way. Let me just roll the first squad and we'll see how it goes. Fate, it seems, is not without a sense of irony. For the dice gods decided that this was the game they were going to bless me. My first platoon starts off proceedings by opening up with their autocannons against an enemy raider. I have eight shots and I get eight hits. I then proceed to easily penetrate the thin armor, exploding the vehicle in a glorious fireball. A bunch of Eldar infantry tumble out. I decide that I'm going to try and pepper them with a volley of mortars. One of my heavy weapon teams opens up and gets a direct hit. This means that the entire squad of three mortars is able to blast all of the Eldar infantry that tumbled out of the vehicle back to the warp. Upon witnessing the devastation, Kat's face falls. And I look over rather sheepishly and say, surely that was just a one-off. I won't do it again. I just got lucky. Second platoon. Let's fire them next. Four Laz cannons completely core an Eldar Wave Serpent. And the five Howling Banshees that tumble out are easy pickings for a unit of conscripts. Cat's lips begin to tremble. I struggle to look her in the eye whilst third platoon's plasma guns turn a venom into molten slag. And the five witches that get out are quickly perforated by a command squad special weapons. Cat's eyes begin to water. Situation fails to improve when fourth platoon leaves another wave serpent a smoldering wreck and Cat's warlord, which happened to be inside it, is annihilated by the concentrated volleys of another couple of mortar support teams. Tears are now streaming down Kat's face as she removes a fourth skimmer from the board and with it, over 50% of her army has already been killed. By now, things have got a tad awkward and the people on the tables either side of ours have begun looking over, wondering what the heck is going on. Kat manages to pull herself together for a second and chokingly asks, between the sobs, have I finished my shooting phase yet? I'm looking everywhere but her as I respond. Um, actually, I'm not even halfway done yet. With the benefit of hindsight, I now realize this was not the right answer to give. And I appreciate that Kat wasn't really asking a question. She was imploring me to stop. But here's the thing. As a young 20 year old man at the time who went to an all boys school for seven years and only ever had one serious girlfriend who is Mrs. Mordian, who is pretty tomboyish and is probably tougher than I am. My ability to handle a grown woman in her early thirties crying is pretty limited. And so I don't really deal with the situation very well. Most normal people would have paused the game there 
and gone over and consoled their opponent and given them a chance to compose themselves. Maybe then they would have felt a bit better and they could have continued playing the game. My solution was to completely turn in on myself and awkwardly continue to roll dice whilst desperately trying to ignore the evil stares that I'm getting from the people around me. I mumble something about 5th platoon targeting an enemy raider. I grab my dice and inevitably the skimmer goes sky high. But not only is it destroyed, it actually erupts in a massive explosion. This has the added bonus of catching a venom in the blast, which then also proceeds to be destroyed and also blows up in a huge fireball. This is the straw which breaks the camel's back and with a widow's wail, Cat completely loses it, breaking down into uncontrollable tears. With snot bubbling out of her nose, she desperately cries about how she doesn't even want to be here. Her boyfriend made her come and this whole experience has just been terrible. The hall is so cold. She's so tired. She just wants to go home. Of course, by this time, everyone in the bitch zone was looking over at our table, wondering what the hell all the commotion is. And I'm stood there stock still like a rabbit in the headlights with no idea what to do. A few people come over to the table and whilst glaring daggers at me, they managed to get Kat to explain that she's here with a boyfriend. She doesn't want to play anymore and they take her up to the main gaming hall where he can be found. With Kat gone, several players accost me and they're like, dude, what the fuck is going on? What the hell did you say to her? What the hell is wrong with you? But before the situation can escalate any further, one of the TOs comes over to the table. He asks everyone to step back and he calmly turns to me and asks me to explain what's happened. I shrug my shoulders and I point over to the table, gesturing at the models that are all set up still. And I just say, she brought Eldar skimmer spam. My entire army ignores cover. The TO glances at the table, glances back to me, chuckles to himself, and whilst trying not to smile, asks, how far through the game did you get? I shrug my shoulders once more and tell the TO that we only got halfway through my turn one shooting phase. He looks at me with shock, but fortunately, one of the people that were playing on the table next to me was a good friend of mine called Stu, and he corroborates and backs up my story. The TO lets out a snort of laughter, slaps me on the arm, and goes, do you want to call that 20 nil? I pause for just a moment, and then I'm like, yeah, all right then. With the ruling made, the judge shooed everyone else back to their table, and I was left to enjoy the fact that I just won my first major tournament victory with Imperial Guard in 7th edition. And all I'd had to do was humiliate and break a fellow human being. Sadly, I didn't see Kat or her boyfriend for the rest of the tournament. If I had done, I would have definitely made strong efforts to apologize to the both of them. I don't know if they left the event early or if it was just the fact that they stayed up in the main hall where I got to languish in the bitch zone for the rest of the tournament. But one thing that did happen is I had to endure merciless teasing from my friends and fellow players for the rest of the weekend with a constant stream of people coming up to me on the second day asking me, is it true? that you made that lady cry. Rest assured, it was all done in good humor, but every single time I had to retell the story, my shame grew and deepened ever further. In fact, to this day, it's a story my friends relentlessly torment me with, never letting me forget the most cringe moment in my entire life. And now I've told the whole internet which probably wasn't the smartest move, but maybe in some small way it will help me atone for my sins. 
Let me know down in the comment section how much of a scumbag you think I am. Lambast me, rake me over the coals. I deserve it all. I hope you guys have enjoyed today's video. If you have, make sure you smash that like button. Like my autocannon smashed cat's hopes and dreams. And also subscribe to never miss an episode. If you like this kind of content and you want to see more of it on the channel, then please consider becoming a Patreon or channel member. By becoming a supporter, you will unlock a whole host of perks, including access to the Mordian Glory Discord server, an online community with over 1,500 active people. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We've got tactics, army lists, painting, hobbying, and we've even got a pretty spicy meme section as well. And before we go, I just want to say a big thank you to the latest channel members. So thank you to Anton J, Black Knight 1921, Valkyrie Studios, Fink and Fan, Scumby, Mate, Bro Chucky, Slices and Dices, Nathan Hall, Halo Zorro, Ronnie, Frantic, Wesley Herbert, an extremely real human, Jake Elstone, Totally Legit, Percy McDonald, I Have a Dig Bick. Mark Fairbrother, Kyle C, Reaver102, Brian Brink, Matty, Eric, Graham Wuff, Josh Van Alstein, Multi Maltieri, Major Problems, and Red Bear 27 Thank you guys for doing your part. I also want to shout out the latest Patreons as well, so a massive thank you to Strigori Queen, Mark Wilson, Marion David K, August, Bad Bet, Percy McDonald, Kevin Goodrich, Proxy Nevada, and Jonah Payne. And last, but certainly not least, I would like to say a personal thank you to all of my top tier Patreon supporters. These are the War Masters, the people who have truly gone above and beyond the Call of Duty. So a massive thank you to Alan Blunt III, Bon Bon Vert, Mark Panconi, Ross Miller, Swordfish Trombone, John Stubbs, Diesel Fox, and August Varney. Thank you guys. Without your generous support, I wouldn't be able to do Mordian Glory full time. Hope you enjoyed today's video. Thank you for watching. And of course, as always, I'll see you guys next time.